So let's have a nice discussion here on a number of topics. Let's start with the diagnosis here again. Uh, Arami, we had a case here where the hematocrit was 63%. The patient did have a bone marrow biopsy, but is it absolutely necessary? No, so you bring a good point. So I don't think you need a bone marrow for establishing the diagnosis in those cases. So if the hematocrit is high enough, with the presence of clonal marker like JAK2, I think one can make the diagnosis of polycythemia vera. However, we do get bone marrows at baseline typically, and I do them for more of prognostic value and as a baseline to have as you know the patient disease progresses down the road to compare to. There are studies that look at presence of fibrosis, for example, on the bone marrow in P. vera, and that could be prognostic. Uh, I like to get a baseline because if there is a question later on of transformation, I would like to compare a baseline. However, in certain cases when the hematocrit is high enough, you know, you have a clonal marker positive, you do not need the bone marrow for establishing the diagnosis. So in this case, for example, the very high hematocrit with the JAK2 mutation positivity on blood with the low serum erythropoietin, perhaps even iron deficiency, you would have enough there to say it's a, it is a PV. Now, yes. In terms of uh, uh, bone marrow, so you have some prognosis there, 20% of the patients may have a grade two fibrosis already at the time of diagnosis. You can also do the cytogenetic analysis to see occasionally there are some patients with uh, chromosomal abnormalities. Briefly, what's the role, is there a role of a genetic testing, uh, extensive genetic testing other than the JAK2 mutation? There are some information, but is it practical to test it for? Do we need it in short order? Yes, no, maybe? You know, so that's a great question as well. So I think uh, uh, in brief, the, the, the role of that is right now more of a research role uh, because uh, there are some mutations, SRSF2, ASXL1 and, uh, uh, and IDH that are, uh, that are adverse in PV. But, uh, but again, you're not going to act on them right now. Uh, so this is a, uh, quite often a debated topic, whether everyone should be tested. Now in, in research institutions such as ours, we do that. But, and, and it's important from, you know, from a research standpoint, I think. But right now from a patient care standpoint, perhaps not in a universal manner. Now, when we come to therapy, then hydroxyurea comes up as a, as a drug of choice. Although the guidelines that uh, Andrew you just showed very well would suggest the hydroxyurea or interferon. Is hydroxyurea preferred in your hands and uh, are there cases for interferon? And once you start the cytoreductive therapy, what are the goals? Is it just hematocrit? Is it something else? Is it everything else in blood cell count? Is it symptoms and spleen? Give us a little bit summary here quickly. What, what do you choose and what do you aim for? Yeah, so uh, I think when, when starting patients on therapy, we, we mentioned that hydroxyurea and, and interferon are both options first line. Uh, typically speaking, uh, I think that we often consider interferon more for younger patients, um, that, that, uh, that we, we think that there's a, maybe a little bit of a better role for using this long term uh, in those, and hydroxyurea uh, more for the older patients. Now, I think that they're both options, uh, and certainly they're, they're very different, and, and there's a lot of discussion as far as which one is, is more appropriate in different uh, circumstances. Um, you know, as far as hydroxyurea, uh, we know it's, it's been used for a long time. It's easy. Uh, it's, it's ex we have expected, um, you know, side effects that we know how to manage. Uh, it's relatively cheap. It's oral, easy to take. Interferon. Uh, for the most part, we're using pegylated interferon, which is uh, a septaneous injection uh, given weekly. Uh, the cost of that is a little bit different, and so sometimes that factors into that as well. Um, but in, the goal of this is to, to really improve the quality of life of the patient and prevent thrombosis. Uh, in general, polycythemia vera has a, has a favorable prognosis, uh, and so we have to think about not just uh, improving you know, quantity of life or, or, or reducing the risk of thrombotic events, but also maintaining a quality of life as well. Uh, and so when you mention the aspects of, of what do we consider uncontrolled disease in the setting of cytoreductive therapy, I think that there's, there's easy things. We wanna prevent thrombosis. We wanna be able to control blood counts. Uh, we wanna keep people functional and active. Um, but there's also a lot of other things that go into this. Hydroxyurea we looked at was, uh, you know, 
ruxolitinib was, was very good at controlling symptoms of the disease and symptoms of the disease are something that, that is what bothers patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And so in someone whose blood counts are controlled but have uh, you know, debilitating symptoms or symptoms that are bothersome, you know, I think that that's a failure of our therapy and that we need to consider other options. So in the same manner, if we're on some sort of uh, treatment that's requiring the patient to have lobotomies every month, I think that could also be considered a failure of therapy.